Hello, welcome to the EKG Guy, and welcome to the EKG of the Week. I hope you're having a wonderful week, and I'm glad you could join us. So this week's case is a 69-year-old asymptomatic female with a history of hypertension that presents to her outpatient clinic visit. Her EKG is shown below. Before we get started, let's review the approach we've been using to interpret EKGs. So notice we have the patient's clinical presentation and then the EKG below it. On the right side of the screen, we have a list that we'll go through before making our final interpretation. First, there's the regularity of the rhythm. That is, are we dealing with a regular or irregular rhythm? And then if it's irregular, is it regularly irregular or irregularly irregular? Next, we have the heart rate, in which we simply want to determine what the rate of the rhythm is. Then we have the rhythm origin. That is, where is the rhythm actually starting from within the heart? Then we have to find the ventricular or QRS axis, which could help us with, the, with our differential diagnosis. And then there's the atrial, atrioventricular, and intraventricular conduction. Here we're going to look at the conduction to see if it's normal or prolonged. Then we have the waveforms, which would include all the waves, the segments, and the intervals. And lastly, anything else, meaning is there anything else that we've missed or still need to mention? After that, we will use all this information that we've gathered to make a final interpretation of the EKG. Now I want you to pause the video and take a few minutes to go through it yourself. When you're ready, start the video and we'll go over it together. Okay, so our 69-year-old asymptomatic female with a history of hypertension that presents for her outpatient visit in this EKG. So let's walk through it. So first, what is the regularity of this rhythm? Well, on first impression of the EKG, you probably notice that the rhythm appears quite regular. In fact, this is a regular rhythm. So how do we know if a rhythm is regular? Well, one of the easiest ways is to look for the R waves and look to the R to R intervals, okay? And when we look at the regularity, we're looking for intervals that are normal. So if we have one R wave to the next R wave, so this is the R to R interval, we want those intervals between each one to be the same, okay? And if you were to get your calipers out or a piece of paper, you would notice that all these intervals are pretty much the same throughout. So we call this a regular interval. So the regularity is regular, okay? So what do you get for the heart rate? Well, there's a couple of ways we can figure out the and calculate the heart rate here because we're dealing with a regular uh, rhythm. So one of the ways is by knowing that the whole duration of this uh, standard 12 lead EKG represents 10 seconds. Okay, so this whole thing across is 10 seconds. So if you multiply that by 6, that gives you 60 seconds, which is one minute. And that means if you count the number of complexes going across the EKG and multiply that by 6, you can get a rough estimate of the beats per minute. So let's do that here. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, so we counted 14 QRS complexes going across. So what we would do is 14 times 6, okay, and 14 times 6 is 84 beats per minute. Okay, and that would be our ventricular rate. You could use the same thing and do that with the P waves, and you should get something very similar in this case to that. Okay, and that we would be that would be the atrial rate. Okay, so our rate here is 84 beats per minute. Now, because we're dealing with a regular rhythm, we can use another approach, and it wouldn't. You want to find an R wave that falls on one of the thick lines. So we can take this one, for instance, here. And we want to count the number of thick lines uh, until the next R wave. So here's our next R wave, okay, at this point here. And what is the number of thick lines between it? So we have one, two, three, four. So about four. So what you would do is 300 divided by four, and that's 75 beats per minute, okay? So that's a another way to estimate the rate here. Now, most EKGs will have the rate on it, which helps you uh, from having to do this, but uh, when you deal with irregular rates or, you know, any times, you want to always make sure and check it for yourself to uh, make sure the machine hasn't made a mistake. Now, the actual rate here in this case was 83 beats per minute, okay? So quite close to our estimate in this case. Now to the rhythm origin. Well, we have narrow QRS complexes, so it must be supraventricular in origin. That is originating from above the ventricles. We can also make out clear, defined, similar shaped P waves. So we have to ask ourselves, are we dealing with sinus rhythm? So let's see if we have sinus rhythm present. Okay, so how do we know if we have sinus rhythm present? Well, we want to look at a few leads uh, to see, it, first of all, if we have these upright P waves in those leads. Now, Remember, when we draw out a simple box diagram of the heart, the right atrium's here, this is the left atrium, 
our right ventricle and left ventricle. Okay, remember our sinus node is up here in our uh, right atrium near our superior vena cava, has these internodal pathways come to our AV node. There's also a Bachmann bundle that comes to the left side of the heart, okay? And then from our AV node, we have the His bundle that uh, then splits off into the right bundle branch that innervates the right ventricle. And then we also have the left bundle branch that subdivides into a left anterior and left posterior fascicle. Both these fascicles and the right bundle branch then go to the ventricular Purkinje fibers that innervate the cardiomyocytes, okay? So that's the general pathway. And we know that our sinus node is up here, okay? And if conduction is going to be heading in this direction, we're going to want to see P waves, okay, that represent atrial depolarization having being upright in which that uh, mean electrical axis is heading in that direction. So if you superimpose it on this case, okay, the normal P wave axis is between zero and positive 75 degrees, okay? So you'd want leads that were heading in this direction to have upright P waves, okay? So if you recall at zero degrees, this is where lead one sits, okay? At positive 60 degrees, you have lead two's positive end. Here at positive 90, you have AVF, okay? This is plus or minus 180 degrees, and then this would be negative 90 degrees, okay? And when we look at our axis coming up, uh, this will be helpful. Now, other leads that sit in the direction of this electrical axis are leads V4, V5, and V6, but those are in the horizontal planes, okay? So those are part of our precordial leads. So because the axis is heading, in, or the impulse is heading in that direction, we want to see upright P waves in these leads over here, okay? Remember, AVR is over here, so we'd want to see a negative or inverted P wave in that case. So let's look at our EKG now here, okay? So here's lead one and here's lead two, okay? This was lead one and lead two, and we wanna see upright P waves in those leads. So here's a P wave, P wave, a P wave, okay? You could see them all upright, okay? And then if we look at our left lateral precordial leads, V4, V5, and V6, you can also see them here. The P waves are upright in these leads, okay? So the mean electrical impulse is heading in those directions. If we look at AVR, we see inverted P waves, okay? So that's part of the criteria. Another thing is that we want these P waves to have a similar morphology throughout. Okay, and if you look at each lead, you'll see that in this case. You also want a P wave before each QRS complex. Okay, so if you look at this rhythm strip, here's a P wave, here's a QRS complex, a P wave, a QRS complex, and if you went throughout, you'd see the same thing, okay? So there's always a P wave that precedes each QRS complex, and there's always one P wave for every QRS complex, okay? So in fact, we are dealing with uh, sinus rhythm, okay? So the origin of this rhythm is from the sinus node, okay? So sinus rhythm. So let's look at the ventricular or QRS axis here, okay? And you should have gotten a normal QRS axis. The actual value here was positive 59 degrees, which is within normal limits, okay? So let's look at how we find our axis here. We'll erase this. Okay, to clear this up for you. So, okay, we'll label this again. This is zero degrees where the positive end of lead one sits. Here's AVF, okay? Its positive end is at positive 90 degrees. This is plus or minus 180 degrees, and this is negative 90 degrees. So the best leads, and usually we wanna look at one in AVF, sometimes we'll lead, use lead two as well. So in this case, we'll look at uh, lead one, and notice we have upright, positive complexes, okay? Meaning that we're heading towards the positive end of lead one. If we look at AVF, which is this lead, you can also see positive upright complex in there. So we're heading in this direction. So our axis lies somewhere within this region, which is already within our normal axis, okay? If you recall, normal axis, normal ventricular axis is between negative 30 degrees and about positive 105 or positive 110 degrees in that region there. So we're clearly within that, so we have a normal axis here. Now, if it was up in this region, we'd call this left axis deviation. This would be right axis deviation, and this is an extreme axis deviation, sometimes referred to as no man's land, that is, and that's rare, okay? So in this case, we have a normal ventricular axis, and the axis here was positive 59 degrees. So positive 59 degrees would be maybe somewhere there, okay? So how about atrial conduction? Well, typically we will look at leads two and V1 for P wave or atrial abnormalities as they appear to be most evident in those leads. There are small biphasic P waves in lead V1 that you can make out here. Okay, this is lead V1. But the P waves are much easier to make out in lead two. So this is lead two and you can clearly see these P waves that we pointed, okay? 
out there. Now the P wave duration appears within normal limits. Normally the P wave duration is typically defined as less than 120 milliseconds or three of the small boxes. Now if the P wave duration is prolonged, then we're going to start thinking of more left atrial abnormalities. And this is because the terminal portion of the P wave represents left atrial depolarization, while the initial portion of the P wave represents right atrial depolarization. Anyways, it's normal here, so we don't have to worry about that. Okay, so we have normal atrial conduction in this case. How about atrial ventricular or AV conduction? Well, in this case, we are looking for any conduction delays as the impulse travels between the atria and the ventricles. Now, because the majority of the PR interval represents the AV nodal conduction, we're going to look there. The normal PR interval in adults is between 120 and 200 milliseconds, or three to five small boxes. Here, the PR interval is within normal limits. It's actually measured at 160 milliseconds, okay? So 160 milliseconds is normal, okay? So let's just draw our complex out here. So you can see this is a P wave. QRS complex and a T wave. So just remember the PR intervals from the beginning of our P wave up until the beginning of our QRS complex. And we said that is normally between 120 and 200 milliseconds. Okay. So if you were to uh, look at the lead here, okay, so let's look at this rhythm strip. Here's lead two. If you look at this point here, you can see that it's clearly within one of the big boxes. So less than 200 milliseconds. And we said it was 160 milliseconds here. Okay, so that's normal PR interval, normal AV conduction in this case. So next we have intraventricular or IV conduction. Here we're going to look at the duration of the QRS complexes. Normal QRS duration is often between 70 and 110 milliseconds, or about two to three of the small boxes. The main thing we're checking for uh, with intraventricular conduction is whether or not the QRS interval is prolonged. We can see narrow QRS complexes that appear within normal limits here. In fact, the QRS duration uh, is 80 milliseconds, so that helps us to confirm that the IV conduction or intraventricular conduction is normal. Okay, so you'll also get this number on uh, most EKG uh, strips. Okay, and it was, we said in this case, 80 milliseconds. Remember, normal between 70 and 110 milliseconds. Okay, so how about the waveforms? Well, we said the P waves uh, were normal with no significant P wave prolongation or an increase in amplitude in leads 2 or lead V1. Now, there's no abnormal Q waves present here. The T waves are present. They're asymmetric and appear normal. Generally, the T wave amplitude decreases with age and tends to be lower in females than males. It is typically considered abnormal if it's less than 10% of the R wave amplitude. The T wave amplitude is typically greatest in leads V2 and V3. And on average, uh, it's 0.3 to 0.4 millivolts in adult women. Okay, now the PR segment we can see here is not significantly depressed or elevated. Remember the PR segment is the, from the end of our P wave up until the beginning of our QRS complex, so that region there. Okay, so no significant elevation or depression. The PR and QRS intervals we said were normal uh, in this case. The QRS amplitude appears normal, okay, and the ST segment does not appear uh, significantly elevated or depressed anywhere on the EKG. And lastly, with the waveforms, the QT interval is within normal limits. So overall, there are no major waveform abnormalities here, okay? So the waveforms, we will just write normal. So is there anything else that we're missing? Well, how about the R wave progression in the precordial leads? Normally, the R wave amplitude should progressively increase from leads V1 through V5, and that's exactly what we see here okay so if I just erase some of this here so we can clear it up okay so we're looking at our wave progression and we're looking at the precordial lead so v1 through v6 we're saying from v1 to v3 uh, v2 v3 v4 and v5 we want to see an increase in the r wave amplitude remember the r wave is the first positive deflection after a p wave of our qrs complex so this is an r wave another r wave okay and notice how the r waves uh, amplitude are increasing Okay, so notice it's smaller here, slowly increasing throughout, okay, up until V5. So we would call this normal R wave progression, okay? So that's what we want to see. Now the transitional zone in the precordial leads appears to occur somewhere between leads V2 and V3 here. The transitional zone is simply the precordial lead uh, where the QRS transitions from being mostly negative to mostly positive, with the actual transition area to be where the QRS is actually isoelectric. Normally the transition occurs between leads V3 and V4, Okay, and if it occurs earlier than V3, we call this a counterclockwise rotation or early transition. If it occurs after lead V4, then we call this a clockwise 
normalize or late transition. Therefore, because the transition occurs, uh, in this case, somewhere between V2 and V3, we would consider this a slight counterclockwise rotation or early transition, okay? So remember the transitional zone, I'll erase this again for you. So we're looking from in the precordial lead, so again, from V1 through V6, where is it going from being mostly negative to being mostly positive, okay? So look at V1 here is mostly negative, V2 still mostly negative, okay? And then we get to V3, and notice it's mostly positive, okay? So that we're going from V2 to V3 is where our transition is taking place, okay? The actual transition is where it's isoelectric, meaning the uh, amount of positive and negative amplitude is the same, okay? So it's occurring somewhere between V2 and V3. Because it's occurring before V3, then we call this a counterclockwise rotation, okay, or early transition. Okay, so counterclockwise rotation or early transition. Now, one thing I want you to always keep in mind with R wave pro progression and transitional zone is that it's highly dependent on lead placement. Okay, so make sure you're always keeping that in mind. So what's our final interpretation here? Well, we have a regular rhythm with sinus origin and a rate of 83 beats per minute. We have a normal ventricular access. There is normal atrial AV and IV conduction. There are no abnormal waveforms and the R wave progression and transitional zone appear generally within normal limits. So this is an EKG showing normal sinus rhythm. Now, great job if you're able to get that all on your own. Okay, so our final interpretation, we'll just write it here, is normal sinus rhythm, okay? And it's important to be aware of how to uh, find uh, out if we have this present, okay? A lot of people struggle with just identifying sinus rhythm, so if you can get that, great job. Now, in conclusion, our 69-year-old asymptomatic female with a history of hypertension has an EKG showing normal sinus rhythm. Well, that's the end of this week's EKG of the week. I hope you learned something. Please don't forget to like this video and leave a comment below if you like what we're doing. In fact, many of you have asked how you can help us out. Really, the best way would be to simply subscribe and share this resource with your friends. You get free access to more than 300 videos. There's also a community of over 150,000 of us like-minded individuals on Facebook. So stop over and join the EKG Guys Facebook community. If you need a crash course on EKGs, we launched our new EKG course. Check the link below if you're interested. The original cost is around $150, and I believe I made it less than $20 for a limited time. I may be biased, but after reading nearly every EKG, textbook on the market, I think this is by far the best EKG series to take you from the beginner level to a physician level. I've even included our pediatric lectures. Anyways, check it out for yourself. I think you'll really enjoy it and a number of medical schools and hospitals are beginning to use it. If you are a part of an institution, please contact us because we're giving a limited number of schools and hospitals free access to provide feedback and improve our course. And in that case, you can get the course for free. So leave a comment below and get in touch with us. And of course, check out our brand new website ekg.md, the premier EKG resource for medical professionals, where you can find more lessons and practice. That is www.ekg.md. Last but certainly not least, your feedback is incredibly helpful and your kind words are always an encouragement on those long days. So let us know how we're doing. Thank you again for your support. It is truly appreciated. We're the largest, fastest growing EKG resource in the world.